Check, check, radio check. I want to welcome everybody. I'm going to go ahead and show my video now so some people can see that I'm back from vacation. I want to thank everybody for taking time uh, out of their busy weeks and joining us here on this call. We've been doing these calls since uh, COVID hit last year and it's been just over a year now. I want to tell you that I appreciate each and every one of you. For those of you that may be on the call for the first time or new or maybe not familiar with the format, we are not selling anything here. We're asking you to leave your checkbooks and your wallets at home. We believe in education first, that if we can help you to understand things in the marketplace, you can make better decisions. So as a financial planner of 30 years, I have affiliates that I have invited you to this call. You know, we are part of a nationwide organization called the Eagle Team. And we're like-minded advisors. We're holistic in nature. We believe in taking a fiduciary approach to our clients' best interests, giving them thoughtful uh, uh, advice. And every client's um, situation and circumstances are different. And I say that because quite often people will piecemeal solutions together without a full, complete picture. And, and that can be problematic in the future. So we just want to make sure that as we continue to move through a rapidly changing economic and uh, physical environment, right, with COVID, that we're able to share with you some of the things that we're seeing in the marketplace, changes in directions. And I'm very blessed to be able to bring for the second time, Mark Diorio. Brookstone and Formula Folios have come together. We're really, really excited about the thought process, the designs, the strategies that Brookstone has to offer. And that takes us to something called the core, which is, you know, a risk appropriate type investment philosophy. So every person's different, right? So don't go taking your entire retirement account and going down to Atlantic City and putting it on red. That's never a good idea, right? But once you understand what your comfort level with risk is, you have this core sort of investment philosophy. Once you have that in place in a world that is changing, as I mentioned, there's a hunt for yield, a hunt for returns. So, um, you know, one of the things that Brookstone does a great job of in simplifying and offering folks that want to participate is a satellite environment. So two weeks ago, one of the satellites that we introduced was something around surrounding structured notes, which are, are really designed about reducing risk and creating bond alternatives as, a, as the world starts to create and seek yield. This week, another satellite is more in the growth arena. Um, I was very intrigued as I've started to do a deeper dive and I've started to see a huge trend into this area. I, I think it's something that should be considered and, you know, as, as part of not an all in solution, but maybe starting to figure out a way to add to a strategy or to a core an idea of return. So I've invited Mark, Mark Diorio, who is the CIO. He's also a CFA at Brookstone to join us here again. And graciously, he's offered his time, his expertise, and his wisdom, right? Mark, I am very comfortable in saying that quite often when we're in a room of financial advisors, usually Mark is one of the smartest people in the room, right? And I, and I say that very uh, sincerely because, you know, you don't earn that designation CFA unless you know what the hell you're talking about. Right. So as a chief investment officer of Brookstone Capital, which is a seven plus billion dollar RIA firm, he has a lot of responsibilities. And for him to take time to, to get on a call with one of their advisors, me and our group of advisors, the Eagle team and their clients. Right. I, I'm, I'm just very honored. So I want to turn it over to Mark and, and Mark will take us through one of the investment strategies that could be available to you. And if you want to learn more after this call, then just reach out to us. So without further ado, I'm going to follow Mark's lead and I'm going to let him take us through the slide presentation. Well, great. And thanks for that intro, Chris. And uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for, thanks for taking some time as well uh, to go through this. And as Chris was mentioning, we use a core plus satellite portfolio allocation framework. So what that means is you identify your risk appropriate core portfolio and you build that with a combination of traditional asset classes and stocks and bonds and 
and put them in the right mix so it aligns with your risk profile. But in addition to that, we think there's room, and especially in today's environment, and we'll go over one, one of the reasons today, and we went over another reason a couple of weeks ago, is that given the low interest rate environment, given all the technological developments that have been occurring uh, and at a faster and faster pace, we think there's definitely room to add satellite allocations to complement your core portfolio and essentially do things to augment that core or do things that the core portfolio just isn't designed to do. So one of those a couple of weeks ago was on structured notes and really looked at how do you implement those and complement your core portfolio and try to augment or increase the income that that portfolio is producing. The low interest rate environment is going to be with us for a long period of time. It already has been with us for a long period of time. When most people thought it was, including professionals, that it was transitory, these low interest rates, it wasn't too long ago that financial professionals were hemming and hawing about a 4% yield on the 10-year Treasury. Well, we haven't been above 4% in over a decade and currently below 2%. A year ago, about this time, we were below 1%. So this is with us for a long period of time on the low interest rate environment, but then also just the speed of technology and some of the advancements that have been uh, occurring, we think are are really jarring and are really going to come to bear into our economic environment over this decade. And so we want to be ahead of that trend and participate in some of those macro or major trends or themes that are going to play out over the next several years. So this isn't about a six-month discussion. This is what we think we're going to be talking about really for the, the entire decade, an exciting area. And we what we coined a couple of years back uh, of how we would describe the economy was really this is the autonomy economy. And maybe you hear about autonomous vehicles and flying drones and so forth and all these things that sound like the Jetsons, but that may not be as far away as they once were. And so those are a couple of the trends, but there's a number of others. And when we took a step back and looked at the market landscape, what we saw from an investment perspective was there was a lot of money going into two areas, really just pooling in two areas. One was passive-based index investments. And we use index-based investments all the time to build parts of the core portfolio. We like them for all the right reasons, but they're market cap weighted, meaning the largest companies occupy the largest allocation in most of the traditional indexes that you would use to build a portfolio, which is okay, but that's also benefiting companies that have already gone through their biggest growth phase. On the other side was there was a lot of private capital. So the uh, ultra high net worth investors were putting money into private equity. The problem there was there wasn't that much to really go after in that space. So it's somewhat limited. What was being completely ignored or left out because they didn't have an anchor investor were these public companies that were, so they were already public, but they weren't big enough to be in the indexes. So they didn't attract the index money. And then they didn't attract the private equity money because the private equity money was looking at companies that were not yet public. So you have these public companies focusing on disruptive technologies. They were just underappreciated, under-indexed, under-invested, but they had scalable business models, massive markets, and what's really labeled theme-based or thematic investing. And so thematic investing is really looking at these macro-level trends and then trying to identify the underlying investments that stand to benefit from those trends. So you're really trying to capitalize on future trends. And here is the number of platforms that have kind of exploded onto the scene. And these, this chart on this page takes you back and uh, some of the innovations that had really big impacts on economic activity from the steam engine, of course, railways and railroads. That was a major part. It was a major part of the markets for uh, a number of years in the 19th century and even into the early 20th century. But then the telephone, automobile, of course, electricity. Then we come to the computers, Internet. But right now, we've seen an explosion in this for a number of reasons. Part of that is because of the information age is just 
disseminated data. And that's so this is really the next step that the Internet has created. So computers and the Internet, and then this has created a lot of information sharing. And so we see innovation exploding in artificial intelligence, energy storage. So if you think of the obvious one is electric vehicles. Well, whether you think they're here to stay or not, there's definitely a trend and money has flowed in that direction. Uh, and we'll see how that there'll be winners and losers, no doubt about it. But there's been big money behind it and developments going in that direction. Uh, robotics has been another area that's going to change kind of the industrial sector forever. Genome sequencing, we think genomics is really going to take the handoff from pharmaceuticals to be the next generation of healthcare. And then blockchain technology, we call it fintech. Uh, it's, it's very disruptive in the finance world, really about showing improvements. And so these are the platform ideas. These aren't the only ideas. Think of them as platforms, and then there'll be a number of different companies that use this technology in different ways and try to carve out a market or a, a niche. So that's why we're excited because there's so much innovation going on. And the key with innovation, and this sometimes gets missed in all the excitement around a new technology, it's not really the new innovation or the breakthrough at the initial point that really gets investors excited and is used by mass market and is a, actually a profitable endeavor. What happens is, it's not until the cost curve, the cost of producing that item, come down as production increases to where you can get to broad-based adoption. So costs have to come down. If electric vehicles stayed at $200,000 a car, you'd never get to mass market. There'd be a few hobbyists, if you will, but it's really not going to go anywhere because it's not reasonable. You wouldn't make a substitute or a change. However, and this is the breakthrough that kind of Tesla did, and now you see other automakers start to address it, which was the costs were coming down, production was going up, and they were able to fund through the public markets because investors continued to invest in that company, at least bring the cost down. So now it's an actual thought, and now other automakers are getting in the game. So as those productions ramp up, costs come down. But this isn't the only area. Genomics happens as well. So in genomics, to sequence a human genome, 20 years ago, it cost $10 million. You come today, and you're less than $100,000. So there's much more broad-based application of genomics today than there was 20 years ago when genomics and genomic sequencing started. What happens during this cost decline, and you're never sure when that tipping point is, you have an idea uh, of uh, that, well, if costs lower, yeah, you'll have more and more adoption and consumer adoption. It's called the S-curve. And all new technologies go through this S-curve. So this one takes it back to, and it's kind of hard with all these squiggly lines, but they generally where you have a slow adoption phase and then ramp up and then kind of peak out. So you have your early adopters uh, on the low end, and then as you go into mass adoption and then late adopters. And so it's generally called the S-curve on adoption. So you can see the telephone in 1900. If one person had a telephone, it doesn't do them a lot of good because they can't call anybody. It's just one telephone. Then when you get to two telephones, you can call each other. But then when you get to four telephones, now there's multiple calls. And it's not just additive. You actually square it because there can be A can call D, D can call B, C can call A, B, or D. Uh, and so you have a lot more interactions that are occurring here. So then the, as the telephone gets going, then electricity. So they all go through this. But as you move from left to right, what you'll notice is the speed of adoption increases. In other words, that S-curve becomes much steeper, meaning the adoption is much quicker. So if you take the regular telephone from 1900 and compare it to 1990, the cell phone, that curve is a lot steeper and the internet and so forth. And so that's what we, we think is going to continue on that pace. New technologies are going to be adopted quicker, especially if costs can come down in those areas. And why this is really important, and I think this is really overlooked by a lot of pessimists we always see in the financial world, in the investment world, there's always somebody on either the, the media, CNBC, or always giving the negative viewpoint or the pessimistic viewpoint 
and, and it sounds smart and parts of it are, are true, but that's not how it always plays out. And what they ignore is what could happen with automation. So with robotics, for example, you're, if you add robots to the job, they will take away some parts of the job, but they won't necessarily take away jobs. There'll be workers working with robots, just as in the service sector, you work with computers, where it wasn't that long ago where not everybody had a computer on their desk, and today everybody has a computer on their desk. Same idea, and it, you didn't lose jobs over that. You actually made employees more productive, and we think this, is, this same idea is going to happen. And this is just a study from uh, an Oxford study, actually, that for some reason is never quoted anywhere. <laughs> but it shows the GDP per worker in the dotted line and then GDP per worker with automation. And it really looks at, geez, that productivity level of the employee is really going to increase. So, yes, some jobs of the past are going to change, but that's not any different than any other economic cycle that uh, that we've seen through history, that as things change, yes, uh, people have to adapt and employees have to uh, and workplaces have to adapt as well. We think that will actually occur and, and really are looking forward to this. And it, uh, I think it's going to open up opportunities for everybody. And so we're not as negative on GDP growth as uh, is often quoted out there that, oh, we'll have slow growth for, you know, for a, a long time. We, uh, we think we'll actually see an uptick in productivity in a lot of areas. And so when we look at calling this and framing this the autonomy economy, we'd say, okay, the artificial intelligence is going to drive digital economy, uh, new sources of energy are going to take hold. In finance, you'll see the combination of finance and technology. FinTech, one of the popular areas, or, or maybe a, just a name of a company that you may be familiar with is PayPal. Uh, they would be kind of an, an early player in this space, but there's more, more to come. Healthcare, it's genomics, uh, and industrials, it's robotics and how they play a role. And so this is very exciting, forward thinking, and that's why we say it's a satellite allocation. We're talking about areas that are disruptive innovation. They can be exciting. But there's also going to be challenges along the way that you didn't foresee, and there's more volatility when you're holding a piece of this. And really the question is, when we look at investments, it's not, is it uh, a good or a bad investment? It's is it an appropriate investment? And then you'd say, okay, well, for what uh, portion of my portfolio? And as Chris alluded to earlier, this isn't the whole thing. This is, hey, would this make sense as a piece of my portfolio? For some people, it could be 4% or 8%. It's just not a right or wrong answer, but it is an area that you'd say, oh, I'd like to participate in some of those growth-based ideas that we think can outpace the market over time. And this is one of the areas. And one of the firms that we had identified a few years back uh, is a firm called ARK Invest. And they've recently become very popular because of the success and their founder, Kathy Wood, is on TV and has actually been a, a kind of a, a talking point on TV. But what she did was just say, look, we're not following traditional indexes. We're going to create a suite of investment vehicles, ETFs, that are easy to access, comfortable, or at least in a familiar vehicle, um, for investors, you just have to understand what you're doing and do some research behind it to get the allocation or have the advisor be familiar with these investments uh, to get an allocation. And what she did was just create a suite of ETFs that focused on disruptive innovation. So she differentiated immediately from what um, the vast majority of money managers have been doing and said, we're just going to focus on this and we're going to be an active manager in this space and we're going to carve out a niche and really focus on this. So we'll have multiple investment vehicles. Some will focus on the individual themes. So if you like industrial innovation, so that had autonomous vehicles, 3D printing, robotics, there's the industrial ETF. If you like genomics and like what's happening there behind the scenes, there's some great breakthroughs. They're going to continue. It's a fascinating uh, area. And so we have an ETF that you could just focus on genomics. If you want to be part of that and help fund those companies, it kind of gives you two benefits. One, maybe you have the outsized return, but two, uh, maybe you're out helping to fund some breakthrough that, that occurs. And um, uh, that's exciting as well and kind of aligning your values with 
your investment. And then web, next generation web, and then fintech. And then on the next slide, they do have one. If you're to just pick one and say, well, I'm not, I don't need to go into one area. They do have a high conviction uh, um, investment vehicle ETF. ARKK is the ticker that focuses on or put, puts their best ideas in each of those themes together. So they're highly concentrated portfolios. They are very volatile, but you're there for the volatility. You can't go into dis disruptive innovation and then tell me that you were concerned about the volatility. Then there'd be a mismatch there. And then you'd just say, okay, well, again, what's the right position size uh, from your portfolio perspective? So, so Mark, some of these, if I, if I sure. can interrupt here for a second and just point out, because this is something you know that I, you just stated it, but sometimes people don't necessarily hear something that was said. So I wanted to point out that this is not a misprint. This is the returns for these ETFs, you know, in 2020, in 2019, in 2018, 2017. So if we just pick one, like the arc that's on this page, 151%, but would you agree that if you could make 151% rate of return on your investment, that you could lose 100% of your investment. Would that? Would you say that that is in the realm of possibilities, but if you're in it for the long haul or in it from a dollar cost averaging, as that volatility starts to happen, that over time, you will start to see those, those increased returns on a portion of your portfolio. Would that be a fair statement? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say you'd lose 100% because you'd still own the equities, but I would say it would, might feel like it at times because of how volatile it can be, but that's normal. In other words, that's par for the course, and, and that's why you, you really reduce that risk through um, you know, your position size in the portfolio um, uh, and adding it. But you do make a great point, which is just understand that you don't get those big returns without increased level of risk and risk meaning volatility in the marketplace. So that's why to your point, if you said, hey, 4% of your portfolio or five or eight, uh, Caitlin today, who is my right hand lady, she has a Roth account and something if you're going to swing for the fences, right? Because we always have to be cognizant of taxation, right? So we either have uh, contribution limits with the tax deferred vehicle, but I'm, you know, anybody that knows me on this call, knows that I'm always hypersensitive to taxation now and into the future. What kind of arena are we leading into? And if taxation is a concern, you know, if you're going to swing for the fences to some degree, contributing something like this, and I think there's a very low entry level into some of these vehicles, I think it's as low as $250, right? You could do that inside of a Roth, and you could sort of set it and forget it and make contributions on a regular basis and just say, hey, you know what, this is just part of my overall portfolio or a part of the strategy. And, and I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, I think that's great that, you know, you using and implementing the vehicles are, uh, are really important in terms of uh, six, having overall success with an investment strategy. So, yeah, this is great. So this and slide here, normally I put it at the front, but this is sort of a recap of what we've just been talking about. Correct. So in terms of if you just want to visualize your core plus satellite portfolio, you have your core portfolio, and then you can decide on the satellite. These are just allocations that you add to your core portfolio based on your preferences, maybe your outlook, if you're more bullish, if you like these areas, uh, or if you want more income, of course, we, we put it there. But that's but that's the right way to think of it. It's just a piece of the portfolio that complements and may access an area such as this that you're not getting exposure to in your core portfolio. So with that, we are at the point where these are our disclosures, compliance, which both Mark and I are subject to. It says that, hey, listen, the things here, we didn't create these vehicles. We're sharing information but they do include some risk. And, and so the disclosures, uh, we've now stated those, but um, now the, the personal touch is, you know, again, I want to thank Mark for taking time out to help, you know, just introduce a strategy that could be available to anybody that's on this call. If the advisor that invited you on this call um, has access to these, great. Circle back with them and let them know that you'd like to learn more. Uh, if you have a question for me specifically, uh, send me an email. I'd love to do it. There's my email address. You can always call our office. 
but you know, we're, we're just here to bring value each and every week. Now, next week I'm going to do, you know, I've, uh, um, a market update, which, you know, I do once a month. So it's really a sort of a, a rear view mirror approach of, Hey, how did February do? So I'll have some slides. A lot of you are familiar with that. And that'll be the topic next week. And then the following week, um, my, it's my intention to talk to about basically income portfolios. So, you know, things in general to be concerned with in the marketplace as the, as the world continues to look for yield. And that will be a partial conversation on structured notes, and I like to refer to uh, my milk cow conversation. So I want to thank you again, Mark. I mean, you always do a great job. You're so articulate, you're clear, you're concise. It's very easy to understand. Um, I want to thank everybody for being on this call, taking time out of your day. And again, if you need me, reach out. And, and again, we appreciate you and we're here to help and guide and educate. So everybody stay safe and have a great day. Mark, thank you again. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody. All right, guys. Bye-bye.